Okay, um, this week at chapter 9 is for stopwatch time study. And you're already doing it in the lab. Um, this is definitely the most common technique for setting time standard in the manufacturing area. And it's the most important piece of manufacturing. Okay. We use the decimal minutes in time study because the math is easier to handle. So in this stopwatch, we read 0 0.01 minute, so that's hundreds. And for digital watches, we read in 0 0.001 minute in thousands. So that's the manual and the digital. And the practice in time study is to be able to read and record the end time as accurate as you can with a motion of interest or study. So there are six types of stopwatch that we use uh, for a time study. And the very first one is a continuous mechanical stopwatch. So here you can see 10 all the way to 100. So that's your large dial. And that's 0 0.01 hundredths of a minute that we're reading. And the other one right here, little one inside, is your small dial. And that it's only from one all the way to 30, okay? So that just so one revolution is one minute for the big one. The second one is your snapback mechanical stopwatch. It looks like the continuous one. And we use it for both continuous time study and also snapback time study. And this technique is so much faster than the continuous one and also easier. Three watch time study. You can see three watches right here, stopwatches attached to a clipboard. And they're used um, for continuous and also snap back time study techniques. The very first watch when it is stopped by pushing the crown here the second watch is resetting to zero waiting to time the next motion element and the third is restarting the watch and timing the current motion element so that's how three stop watches are working together mtm stopwatch looks like this and we call that the methods time measurement in short mtm so this watch measures time in 100,000 of an hour, so that's 0.00001 decimal minute, or called the TMU, and that's your time measured unit. So one revolution is 0.001 hours, so that's about 3.6 seconds. And it reduces the math required, so therefore they use MTM stopwatch digital stopwatch or electronic timers are so popular now and we use all the time every day. So here are a few examples. The very first one is your nine memory digit timer. It's nothing but you can be able to uh, recall nine readings, okay? In second minutes and hours. The second one is your digital stopwatch and it can time to three decimal place, places. So 0 0.001, the top, the thousand and can be able to store about 500 readings, so it's very convenient. And the third one is your digital stopwatch, and it has only single read up right here. And you can do continuous or snap back ability. This gotta be continuous. Built-in digital stopwatch looks like that because the stopwatch is built into time study board. And it can also display a bright uh, screen, so you can see the LED and LCD displays with it. This one is your industrial timer, and that's the sunlight timer. Computers, we use it all the time for the programmed machine and also programmed workstation. 
and they are programmed to do time study. So there are some commercial micro time study programs built into human machine assembly lines and also specially built hardware available to do the time study used in the industries. And also in computer time study, they have a handheld data collectors. Um, they're definitely widely used because they can be taken to the shop floor. So here you can see this is a red rate setter electronic timer because you can set rate. And this is another computer aided time study program. Boards for holding watches and paper. So here is your clipboard and here we have a stopwatch attached to this clipboard. So just a one watch time study box. It's not very comfortable to hold, but it is functional. So there are many different types from very cheap bots to multi watch digital bots, which are very expensive. Okay, so the next one is your video tape recorders. So this one is pretty new best method to record time because we can catch every motion element in operation. So it uses only a few cents to record workstation operation. And uh, Union is an organization and they control the changes in the time standards in the United States. So Union doesn't allow change in time standard unless there's more than 5% in the change of operation, like machining, tooling, material method, or working condition. Okay, So average 5% change is expected to make a one-time standard change. So that's a union uh, policy. So we are now using monitors. Um, it's just like the surveillance camera, and it's everywhere in the facility floor on the facility floor and uh, you can record to many different operations at the same time and it's also easier to go back to to look at it and record the time. So one uh, industrial recorder can do about 50 operations or more in general so it's pretty uh, useful. Alchemeters look like this and this is another stopwatch and we use it to record the speed of machines and conveyors for motion and time study. So the right here, the center point attachment is placed on a tachometer and placed against the turning shaft chunk board in arbor. So the number of revolutions per minute, and we call that RPM, is recorded in the time study form. RPM is then converted to feet per minute when we're dealing with a wheel, and which is held against a moving conveyors. Calculators, we use it daily all the time and it's totally needed for time study to do math, also to speed up processes and for accuracy. Forms, there are a lot of forms looks like that and on time study forms are the hardest part of time study because you have to fill that form. So the forms lead the us or technician to a correct procedure in the study. So forms are used in continuous snapback or long cycle time study. Okay, so here time study procedure and the step, actually this is step for step or step by step form. So there are 10 steps in time study procedure and 37 steps to fill a form. So here, this uh, picture is showing you the blank time study form with steps and cycles, so you know how to fill step by step. So this is your procedure. So there are 10 steps to do the time study procedure. First, you're going to select the job to study, and then you're going to collect the information about the job, and then divide the job into work elements, and do the actual time study and then extend the time study. After that, you determine the number of cycles to be timed. You rate your level and you normalize the operator's performance. You apply the allowances, and then you're gonna check for logic. And then at last, you're gonna publish your time standards. Okay? If it is necessary, you go back and do some steps as needed. Filling the form, 
needs a lot of steps, so we're going to go one by one. So the very first one, when you look at the form, you're going to see it right here. So your time study worksheet, what worksheet you can do snap back or continuous. So you're going to check appropriate study right there. And the very first one is your operation description right there. Fill the description of what needs to be done or study. And number two is your part number. Number three is your operation number, and you know how to fill that up already from previous chapter. And number four is your drawing number. And number five is your machine name, like whether that machine is a press, a welder, a lathe, or drill, etc. And number six is your machine number. Then we go on to number seven is your operator's name. And then number eight is the months on the job of this operator. Number nine is his or her department. And number 10 is your tool number. And this tool number definitely include the sizes, fixture, drill size, etc. And then we go to number 11, and that's we have part description and material specifications. So make sure you use back of this form or separate paper if you need more room to describe these. Then number 12 is your feet and speeds of your equipment. So you usually get that from the blueprints, sizes, or parts and material specification. And your 13 is you're gonna check if the quality is okay, your safety is already checked around the workstation area that you're studying for the operator. And also you're gonna check your setup the setup of your workstation and your operator tools, including machines or everything is properly set up, okay? 14, uh, right here you can see your element number. So reference element number with more than 10 cycles are timed. And then 15 is nothing but your element description, okay? Whether you're loading and loading, what type of motion are you assembling? Are you doing an operation? of the assembly or is that a pack out every work element is going to be described right here and these are your time study readings block so you can see right here there are eight lines and you have time uh, one all the way to ten cycles so that's a total of eight times ten is your 80 blocks right there okay so you can record 80 readings in there So where do you get your recordings? And that's your readings. You're going to record from your stopwatch and then uh, write that down here in these blocks. Okay. The value got to be two decimal places. So you go 0 0.01, 0 0.02, etc. from your stopwatch. The 16 is going to be your time study readings. So here we're showing you a bigger example. One is for continuous and the other one is for snapback time study. So the first one, here are your elements and load and clamp, run machine and load and place aside are all your elements, okay, description. And then here, these are your blocks. So here in this case, we have three lines and we have five, okay, reading. So for each line, so they're all together three times five, you have 15 readings right here. So here are your recorded time in two decimal places, so 0 0.16, etc. all the way, okay? And you'll record everything from your stopwatch. In the lab, you're already doing it, so make sure you give me two decimal places for these blocks, okay? All right, so snap back example, the same thing, load and clamp, run, machine, and load and put aside. We're going to recall the same thing right here, okay? The only thing that's different is because the stopwatch for continuous and snapback, they're different. So therefore you're getting a little bit different here. And also the operation may be different. So therefore you're getting all different values. Okay, so after we finish 16, we're gonna to go to 17 and that's your total. And then the cycle. So the very, very first box right there, you're gonna put your total. And then the second box, you're going to put your cycle. So fill the total time of appropriate cycle time, which is counted in the study. And number 18 is your average time. So you're going to check the decimal error, average time, 
is not in three decimal places, not like the reading time. Okay, reading time is two decimal. So here we have three decimal, so you go zero one zero zero one unit each. And every time average time, you're gonna calculate divide the total time by number of cycles. Okay, so this is what you're doing. You put here and here and then calculate it and you're gonna put right there. Alright, percent R is your percent rating, is the facility rating of how fast operator is performing. So how are we gonna calculate percent R? You're gonna calculate average time multiply multiply by rating percent divided by 100 is equal to normal time. When you calculate, make sure this is one. Okay, so put this in a bracket. You can be able to get okay. Uh, normal time by using your average time and rating percent. Number 20 is this column and that's your normal time. So the above equation is used to calculate normal time. So it is the amount of time a regular operator at a standard pace would take to produce a part. We already knew that. And then 21 is your frequency. So it's how often the task is performed. And here, example one, if you if QC, that's quality control, you know, ask the operator to inspect one part out of every 10. So that's totally you're taking one sample out of 10 population. So you're gonna fill right here one out of 10 in that space. Okay. Example two, if operator is doing two parts at a time, you're gonna fill one divided by two in this column. Okay. 22 is your unit normal time. Is this little column right there and uh, you will calculate by multiplying this frequency which is this by normal time which is this column. Okay, And that's the time to make one unit of production. So here you can see the normal time and you can see the frequency and you will multiply the two to get the unit normal time. So here 1.160 is your normal time. Multiply by one divided by 1000 frequency and you're gonna get 0 0.001 minute, okay? 23, this column is your range. Range is nothing but just a, just a range of your highest elemental time minus your lowest element of time okay for example one element of a job in minutes is from here all the way to here so that's your data set so therefore a total of element time you're going to add them up you get 0 0.83 so the number of element of time is all together when you count it that's 10 of them okay so your average time you're going to divide the total with your number, so you'll get 0 0.083 minute. Your range, you're gonna choose the highest, okay? That's, we see right there, 10. So 0 0.10 minus the lowest, so here in the data set, that's seven, so that's 0 0.07. So when you minus that, you get 0 0.03 is your range, okay? All right, graphs and tables, we use them very often, okay? And you can get the range out of them as well instead of calculating. So you can hear cycle, okay, needed zero all the way to 200. And then this is your factor. Cycles require the same thing, zero to 700 in this case, and this is your factor. This is a formula that we use to get number of cycles to time study to get range okay also a is your required precision and it must be extended as decimal range which is plus or minus 0 0.05 or plus or minus 10 so that's your standard deviation okay five percent or ten percent and then d2 is just a constant that we use it will always be given to you to estimate time deviation of a sample. So it's a function of the sample size. So it must be obtained from the uh, stat table, okay? And here, this little one is your mean or arithmetical average. 
is nothing but the sum of your observations or data divided by the number of data item. Okay. Here, when you take your square root out, we can rearrange the entire equation by using arithmetic. Okay. So here, table nine one is showing you the number of cycles to time, and then here is your range. So that's based on 95% confidence level. So that's the plus or minus 5% accuracy. We continue to fill in the form. So the column 24 is R divided by your mean. And we call this mathematical expression the factor, the one that you saw in previous slides. So R divided by mean is equal to your range divided by your average time. Example, we're going to use the same example from the previous slide. So your range was 0 0.03 and then your average was 0 0.083. So when you divide that, you get 0 0.36. Okay. Highest the same thing, your highest elemental time. You're going to check right here. Okay, so the column 26 is your factor table. So you can see the list of factors commonly used for 95 percent confidence level with plus or minus five percent error or accuracy so we will use this table to get number of cycles needed so from above table we get r divided by mean is your 0 0.36 so when you look at the 0 0.36 it is between 0 0.3 and 0 0.4 okay so 0 0.3 is on the factor uh, 0 0.36 on the factor table when you look at it it's there, there, it's already 0 0.3 between 0 0.3 and 0 0.4, so the difference is 1. Okay, so 0 0.4 minus 0 0.3 is 0 0.1, but the extra uh, for 0 0.36 is only 0 0.06. Okay, so in that 0 0.06, in between this one mark, it's only 60%. So how do we do it? Is 0 0.06 divided by 0 0.1 is going to give you 0 0.6. When you translate this decimal to percentage, and that's 60 percent. So 0 0.36 is 60 percent from 0 0.3 to 0 0.4. Okay. So from the factor table on the form, we get 0 0.4. When you look at it, that's 27 cycles. 0 0.3 is 15 cycles on this table. So therefore, 0 0.06, that's 60% of 27 minus 15 is 27 minus 15 times 0 0.60. You get 7.2 cycles, okay, for that 60%. So therefore, 0 0.36, so up to 0 0.3 is 15 cycles. And 0 0.3 is 6 before we get to 0 0.4 is 7.2 cycles. So you add them up and you're going to get 22.2 cycles up to 0 0.36 okay, according to this factor table. So that's how we calculate the cycles from the factor. So factor over 1.0, see we get only up to 1 here, but if you get like over 1.0, that's because of your inexperienced operator or time study person is doing something wrong. Okay, so that's a erroneous error. Normal uh, distribution. So when you study the industrial data, so most of the data collected and graphed in a in a stat application or plotting application, whatever application you're using, okay, the data usually show a bell shape okay uh, curve when we graph that data points so that's normally happening with most of the most of the sets of data okay, that you get from industry or manufacturing so uh, anything that you're collecting so so we call this curve normal curve because most of the data sets show this type of shape okay so the data distribution uh, we call it normal distribution because all the data are normally distributed, meaning they are producing a pattern that looks like a little bell shape. So there are other curves, but most phenomena are in nature, okay, and also in industry, they usually show the normal distribution. So that's the nature that we're living in, okay. So if you don't believe me, go ahead and take the height, okay. 
of 100 students in our university. And you're going to see when you graph the data, you will see like this. Okay, You will see a little bell shape like that. So in normal distribution, average or mean is usually right here at the center. Okay, So where this top of your bell shape curve is. Standard deviation is nothing but the data points. They are variable. Data are variable. So the variability of data show the spread or data points on the graph. So here you can see the spread like that. So how variable or spread out the data set or population is showed by standard deviation mathematically. Okay, We can describe many things that are happening uh, in the data by using math. And the quantitative value of degree of variability is thus we call it standard deviation. It's just a term telling you how the data is spreading out. So here when you look at take a look at it, 68.26%. Okay, that is just telling you the data locates between plus, okay, plus and minus one standard deviation. So 95.45 the data is plus and minus two standard deviation away from each other. And 99.73%, the data is between plus and minus three as for standard deviation, okay? 27 is this little box in your form, and we put the foreign elements here. And foreign elements are usually eliminated from time study, uh, but we definitely describe here in this space 28 okay, is right here, and that's your total normal time, and they go by the total normal minute, the same thing. You can get that by using this equation, total normal time, plus allowances, and that's your standard time. 29 is right here, this little plus, man, little, you know, um, dash line right there, and that's your allowance. Okay, you're going to fill your allowance right there, your break time right there. 30 is right here, and that's your standard minute or time in decimal minute. And then 31 is your hours per unit, okay, and that's in you know, a decimal place, 0 0.00001. If you remember, your operation chart is the same thing. And 32 right there is your pieces per hour, okay. You can see right there, 32 is your pieces per hour, pieces per we go by units as well, so it's the same thing right there. So you have to pay attention. The time standard definitely represents the values all the way from 30 to 32. Okay, so these are the elements for your time standard. 33 is right here, and thus engineer or you, okay, time study person name, uh, technologist. 34 is your date. That's the date that you study the time of an operation and approved by this right there. And you don't want to mess this box. You want to leave that open until one of them signs signs that. Okay, your supervisor in small business, and that will be your owner. Thirty six. That's going to be your workstation layout. And uh, you're gonna, you can put the layout right there because it's a very small box. So therefore, we usually use the back of the form or attach a separate paper if you want it to be organized. Product sketch is your 37. We do the same thing. We're going to attach a separate paper with a sketch on it or you will sketch it on the back of it. Here is the field form, an example of that. Okay, You can go back to your handout and make it a bigger or you can also make it bigger on this slide to take a look at it, how to systematically fill it. All right, and this is from the figure, uh, chapter four, five, that I told you we're going to get back to it when we get to the later chapter is one of them, okay? It's just telling you how to fill. It's just a continuous time study form. Rating level in the normalize normalizing. So when you rate an operator, we're looking at a normal industrial uh, standard and you know, operator's skills, consistency, and working condition. Okay, We look all of that before we rate that operator. 
and also effort is very important because effort is the operator's speed or tempo, okay, and it's usually measured based on a normal operator working at 100% of his effort. The example 100% performance rating is walking 264 feet in 1.000 minute. So that's a standard rating, okay. 100% standards and experiments, we can take a look at it, what we are using. So how we compare and rate the operator, we use these standards, okay? So the very first standard is walk a 50-foot um, course, okay? So the this time standard is telling you, you're going to work, okay? And, uh, and that standard is we're looking at three miles in an hour. You should be able to work three miles in an hour, and that is the standard universally accepted. So the standard is three miles per hour. One mile has 5,280 feet. So we're going to translate okay, uh, that into this. So one hour has 60 minutes. Okay. So first, we're going to change miles per hour. Divide that with 5,280 feet, okay? Multiply that, so the mile is going to be cancelled. Divide the whole thing with 60 minutes per hour. So here, you will be cancelling mile, okay? And then you will be cancelling your hour. So therefore, we get feet per minute, okay? And calculate three times five two eight zero divided by sixty is going to give you two hundred sixty four feet. So one minute you should be able to work two hundred sixty four feet, and that is your time standard. Okay. So fifty feet divided by two hundred sixty four feet per minute. So we're going to be getting the standard for fifty feet, and that's you should be able to do that zero point one nine minute. Okay, so 50 feet is nothing from here to over there. So go ahead and time by yourself and walk 50 feet. And if you get around 0 0.19, 0 0.18, 0 0.16, 0 0.17, you're good. Okay, because that's a universally accepted time standard for 50 feet. And it comes from 3 miles per hour. Okay, all right, so therefore when rating is inspected in an operator, we're going to check with this standard time for walking 50 feet. We're looking at 0 0.19 minute per standard. If somebody is not doing okay, 0 0.19 and that person is spending one minute, then um, you got to discuss with the operator, okay? Because you're losing a lot of time in it. Okay, so the next one, if you walk 0 0.18 minute okay, per 50 feet, your performance is kind of okay because you are 0 0.01 minute, okay, uh, above the standard 0 0.19. So that will be percent performance when we calculate. You're going to write down the time standard accepted universally is 0 0.19 divided by your actual time is 0 0.18. So you're going to get 106%, okay, and you're 6% better than the standard. So that's how we calculate. So you can try calculating the percent performance for the table data right here. So here I have a stopwatch actual time, and you have your standard time, and you're going to do this, and give me all your percent performance. Okay. All right, table 92 is your rating. So here it's already calculated for you your percent performance, and then your actual time right there for walking a 50 foot course. Okay. So you can see this percentage is kind of low. And the percentage is kind of over. Yeah. Second standard is a dealing 52 cards in four equal stacks on a card table. And that should take only 0 0.500 minutes. Okay, and they're doing it on a 30 inch square area. So we do the same thing. Percent performance is calculated. Divide time standard by your actual time here in our case. The standard that we're using is 0 0.50, okay, for 50 cards, and we're going to stack in four equal stacks. 
and your actual time it took was 0 0.52 in this example. So your percent performance is 96%, so you are 4% lower than the standard 100% performance. So here you can try the same thing, calculate that by using this equation, and here is a ready-made okay, time uh, uh, percent performance right here and your actual time. The third standard is your example in 30 pins right there into a pin bot that should take only 0.435 minutes. Okay, you're going to use two hands for this method. So this pinball experiment has been around more than 100 years we've been doing this. And this experiment is used to screen okay, the employees. So it should take 0 0.435 minutes to assemble 30 pins in this board. Okay, So here you can try the same thing by using the previous formula that I show you. And then here is your example table, all of your percent performance and your actual times are displayed. This is just for you to know the form and we're not going to ask you to build any of this. So time study rater trainer form. You want to train the time study person to be able to rate fair and squarely. So this form is used to train that rater. Okay, so you only have to take a look at it. So uh, uh, we filled that. I'm not going to ask you in, in the exam. All right, so here is the back of that rater trainer form. It's just to try and tell you the fundamentals of the pace rating here. It's um, you can read it. Okay, one time. All right, allowances. Allowances are again extra time added to the normal time to make the time standard practical and also attainable. And we're looking at the personal allowance, fatigue allowance, delay allowance. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the personal allowance, you're going to see we're looking at the time allow for personal thing, like talking to friends about non-work subjects when you're working, that's just taking time, okay, for that. Um, going to the bathroom, that's your personal allowance time. Getting a drink, personal allowance time. So any other operator control reason for not working, it's your personal allowance time. And if you're using that a lot, then you'll be uh, cheating the company's time, okay? All right, so fatigue allowance. So this allowance is a time an employee is allowed to uh, recover from fatigue, okay, given in the form of a work break. So 5% is a normal fatigue allowance. So if you have like 100 minutes, you're getting 5 minutes out of it, okay? So we apply a 5% increase in allowance for every 10 pound increase in weight if your job consists of lifting, okay? like the UPS or FedEx or the USPS people, um, delivery people who got to carry these inventory, also the same thing for Amazon. So that's how we calculate the allowance okay, for fatigue. Um, in the lab, we're doing 8% because you're getting like a, a 60 okay, minute and you're running your assembly line and we have 5% maximum allowance, so that's 8%. Okay, so lifting a 50 pound job is your example. So the very first is your normal allowance, and we're going to subtract that. So that's only 5% for the first 10 pound. And then, so 10 minus, okay, you minus that all from 50 pound, is going to give you 40 remaining pound. So then you're going to go 5% increase allowance for each 10 pound out of that 40, okay, remaining pounds. So you will get uh, four times. Five, so that's five percent. That's a forty pounds. So you're going to apply four times increase five percent allowance. So that's altogether twenty percent. Okay, and we will add that to our normal five percent, and then twenty percent increase allowance for lifting forty extra pounds is going to give you twenty five percent allowance. Okay, that's your fatigue uh, allowance time or your break time. You need it in order uh, for the the labor to be able to recover from uh, fatigue, you know, that the labor is getting from lifting that weight. If you don't give, that's not humane, okay, in work practices, so you definitely have to give them. Delay allowance is the next type. So the delay allowances are 
unavoidable because they are out of operator control. So some examples are listed right here. So one is waiting for instructions or assignments, so that's a delay. Uh, waiting for material or material handling equipment, so that's also a delay. Okay, so unavoided delays are we usually control them by adding delay allowances to the standard time and also time study them. Okay, we study them and then add them to the time standard and then charge the time to an indirect charge. So that's kind of like balancing okay, the unavoidable uh, delay times. So time study is done to reduce delay time allowances. So we target to eliminate them, okay? Especially in lean environment, we get into that. Total allowance is equal to personal plus your fatigue plus your delay allowances. So this total allowance is gonna to go to that little allowance box right there in the form. And this total allowance to the normal time, we're gonna use that to get your standard time so normal time plus allowance time is going to give you your standard time. Okay. Methods of applying allowances. So how do we do that? So there are many different methods to apply allowances. The very first one that we use is method one. So that's nothing but 18.5 hours per 1,000 pieces of production. So this method takes 54 pieces per hour Okay, with 10% allowance. So with 1.000 minute normal time. So this means work is done, okay? 54 pieces in 54 minutes. So you're taking one minute for one piece. Okay, so that you're giving six minutes. That's 10% allowance for an hour, okay, of work. So that for 18.5 hours is gonna be our standard time for 1,000 pieces of production, okay? If you go with 10% allowance. All right, so here you can try and calculating, okay, um, by using method one. You have your normal minutes right there, and then you have your ratio hours per 1,000 pieces. We're going at 18.5. So you should be able to get pieces per hour right here, okay? Method two is your constant allowance added to total normal time. So this is the most common method that we use in the industry because it's very easy and also fixed, okay, uh, between 10 to 15%. And management uh, states what's included in the allowance. So most of the company use it. All right, so the example is a personal time. It's gonna be 24 minutes. We have two breaks at 10 minutes, so 20 minutes total. And we clean up time took about like four minutes in this example. So when you add them up, you get 48 minutes for your total allowance. So here, if work time was 480 minutes, and then our allowance time is 48 minutes, it's gonna give you 11% allowance, okay? So to get standard time, we're gonna add this 11%, that is 0 0.11 in decimal, to a normal time, 1.000 minutes. So you're producing or working one minute for one piece of work, okay? So that's a 1.000 plus 0.11 is gonna give you 1.110 minutes. So another way to calculate that is to multiply your normal time, which is 1.000 with 111%, okay? So to get that standard time, and it will give you the same here, okay? Standard time. You can calculate this way, or you can calculate that way, you will end it up with the same result. Okay. Method three is your element allowances technique. So this is used when we have different allowance for each element of job. So that's for micro study. Um, so here in this table, you can see each element, work element, load the machine, and then we're looking at the machine time. We're also looking at the unload the machine time. Okay, so unit normal time is listed right there. And then your allowance time, is going to be for each work element, 15% here, 5% here, and then 10% right there. And then you can calculate by using the normal time allowance, and you're going to get that standard time. Okay. Method four is your PFND element allowance technique. So PFND is nothing but your personal, your fatigue, and your delay. Okay. So this allowance is calculated on each element of work, the same thing like the previous slide. 
And this is the best method, but company doesn't really use it. Why? Because it, it costs a lot okay, to study in this way, because you have to go into details for each element description, and then normal time, and then we're going to break into three different allowances for each one of them. Okay, So therefore, it's very tedious, so they don't want to uh, use this method. However, this will give you the best method, because you will definitely get the best standard time, okay? But then uh, we use it only when we're doing a serious research or developing a method or writing a paper, okay, to challenge uh, a company or something. So only that time we use this method. Foreign elements. Foreign elements are two types. So one is your productive foreign elements. The other one is non-productive foreign elements. So here we're going to go with the productive foreign elements. So they are necessary jobs that must be done. Okay, or the operation is going to stop if you don't do this. So therefore, they are, example, cleaning the chips or slugs. Okay, out of the machine, you need it. Another one is the loading parts into a feeder. You have to do this. Okay, otherwise, operation is going to stop. So that's your productive foreign elements that we must spend time. So table 9 and 5 is showing you to so the element description, blah, blah, blah. And then your description 1 all the way to 5. And here is your time. Okay. Non-productive foreign elements are eliminated from the time study. So for example, are dropping apart or just fumbling. Okay. Stopping to talk to the time study technicians. All of that are very non-productive. And we try to eliminate those kind of time. Long cycle time study. All right, so this is just another worksheet, okay, we use for time study. And this is used for long cycle time. That's 15 minute and longer study. And then inconsistent element sequence, okay, and also the eight hour performance studies. All of them are for using this form. Okay, we're not going to ask you, so you only have to read it one time and take a look at how uh, the form looks like pretty actually uh, looks like a PTSS, okay, kind of like that. All right, here another example for your eight hour time study already filled up. And this site is a graphical analysis, okay, or a eight hour time study. Again, you only have to uh, take a look at one time and read and you know how it looks like. We don't have to go into detailed study of this. Okay, step-by-step -step instructions for preparing the long cycle time study worksheet. So figure 925 is an example of worksheet showing steps to fill. Okay? Again, we don't have to do the long study time uh, study worksheet at all, so you only have to know a little bit about that. Vertical time study form, another form. Just to know, so this form to study the time, so instead of going horizontally, so the form, when you pay attention, you're going to see it is going vertically by putting the element across the top, okay, and then the cycles down the page. So the use of this form is the same as that of the horizontal sheet. So again, we're not going to ask you to fill that in, but you have to recognize this is the vertical time study form, right? Okay. So the last one is your best practices, so time study practices and the employee relations. So here are different lists uh, they use in different organizations. This is one common list that you can see in the manual at work. So first one is we usually use a red pen to subtract the previous reading from the current reading. Okay, we just want to know like, what's the difference to get attention, right? And then take time standard. You always have to uh, stand up, okay? In the lab, most of the timekeeper are, are sitting down in group two, I think. So make sure you stand up, okay? We're going to do the wrong three tomorrow. So make sure you correct that. And talk to the operator to make you know operator feel okay and not to be nervous about it. And then be positive about the time standards. Um, operators are kind of, they have attitude, 
and they don't really want to do a time study. So you always have to talk to them and then be positive about your time standards okay, to work with them. And also get the supervisor permission to fill his area on the form. Okay, don't just go and fill their hub. They don't like it. And this got to be put. So put the operator at ease for the study in the same vein as three. Talk to the operators. And when you record the time standard, you have to be very honest. Okay, meaning like don't make it up. Don't make up the time study. You all really, really have to study. Be friendly and happy. Okay, stand where you can see everything about your operator's action because we're catching the operator's motion. So it's important to see the operator. And don't change the standard unless there is a change of over 5% in operation to talk to your union people and then communicate the change to the employees involved in the study. Okay. Right now, we uh, try to get rid of the operator nervousness and everything by using the surveillance camera, uh, the monitoring system. So that's definitely get rid of operator and the timekeeper, you know, uh, nervousness in the time study and also, um, also reduce the conflicts. Okay, so that's it for chapter nine.